Welcome to Seaside Sermons. My name is Bert Allen, and this is a ministry of ChristAssembly.org. We've been looking at the epistle, that's a fancy New Testament word for letter, a letter from Paul to the Thessalonians. You may remember that Paul and si Paul and Barnabas, excuse me, Paul and Barnabas went down to Cyprus and then they went around there and went back to the mainland over there in Asia Minor and then went back home to Antioch. Then they did a second missionary journey and they went farther and they even went up around into Europe. And as they're going into Europe, they go to a place called Philippi, then they go, and that's in Macedonia, up at the top right-hand side of the Mediterranean Sea and most globes. And then if they go a little bit farther left than that to the west, they're going to get to the city of Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica, they meet a really rough group of people. They go to the synagogue. Paul goes to the synagogue every time he goes to town. As a matter of habit sent by God, he proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ and shows them from the scriptures that Jesus really is the Messiah. And so frequently the Jews reject Paul. Sometimes they cause violence to flow upon Paul, either from them directly or through the government or from other means. But Paul met many very vicious people, and a lot of them were at Thessalonica. So Paul stayed there about three weeks preaching to them and then went outside of the synagogue. But the Jews in that synagogue became arch enemies of Paul and even followed him later wanting to kill him and stop his ministry for Christ. It's in that environment of extreme hostility at Thessalonica towards Jesus the Savior and his followers that Paul is writing back to the Thessalonians and saying, I came there, I preached the gospel, and y'all believed. You know, I was reading Acts with a friend of mine last this last week, and I was remembering how it's easy to move on and leave a place when you know you're leaving believers behind who will carry on the work, that most all the time we are not the only believer that God can use, that God has other believers that have already been planted in a place, sometimes through our ministry. And the people that are left behind as born-again believers will use their spiritual gifts to carry on the ministry in that place. So when we come to tight, excuse me, when we come to First Thessalonians chapter three, verse one, we read, therefore, we could endure it no longer. We thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. So if you recall, when Paul left Thessalonica, he went over to Berea. Things got hot there in Berea when the Thessalonians came over there and chased him out. He went down to Athens. He left Timothy and Silas at Athens, and Paul went on ahead down to Athens. From Athens, he went down to Corinth and stayed about three and a half years. But Paul's telling us in chapter 3, verse 1, therefore we can endure it no longer. Paul in chapter 2 had said, you know, we really long to be with you, but Satan has hindered us. And we really wanted to know how you're doing. We wanted to see your face. We wanted to be there. But Satan stopped us from doing that. So Paul's going to send Timothy back there to Thessalonica and find out how things are going. You know, one of the hallmarks, if you're making disciples of Jesus Christ, I call them learners. I'm not a real fan of Latin terminology when we can avoid it. If you're making learners of Jesus Christ, you want to see them, talk to them, and stay in touch with them. And if you don't, something's wrong in the relationship, and you ought to get it cleared up. Whatever it is, get rid of it. So back to this. With that relationship where he loves the Thessalonians, they're under intense persecution. But that's also true of Paul, that Paul is getting full of tribulation and affliction himself. When he gets to Corinth, the Lord Jesus tells him, look, I've got many people in this city. It's a safe enough place for you. And Paul stayed there about a year and a half or so. And things were going well. It's, let's say around AD 51, uh, Gallo was proconsul during that time. And it looks like he took office right around 51 or so, probably maybe July. But Paul was in that area somewhere around 50, 51, maybe even 52. But he was there in Corinth doing his work. But let's go back to the text. So Paul's saying, I really wanted to come. I can't get there. I'm busy doing God's work down here. But I sent Timothy. You know, we should ask in our lives, 
how many people do we have that we really want to see in Christ that we're actively discipling, in this case, making learners? Are we doing that? Are we sharing our faith? Are we using our spiritual gifts every day to the glory of God? Are we daily ministers for Christ? Most of the folks I meet who've been born again have never seen even one person pray to receive Christ with them. Not even one. And that's because they aren't usually out there sharing their faith as God puts people right in front of you who obviously need to hear the gospel. If more believers took it serious that the lake of fire is the destination for all your friends, all your family members, all the folks you know who are not born again, they're all going to end up there. There are no good people. You can say, well, these are nice people. They're good people. They go to church. They sit right next to me. If they haven't been born again, then they're going to the lake of fire. Remember what Jesus said in John 3, 3 to Nicodemus, if you're not born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. So you're in real trouble. He went on to explain to Nicodemus that unless you're born of water and the word, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So he's talking serious stuff. He's not talking about water baptism. He's talking about being born once from your mother, your human mother, but you must be born again by the spirit of God and the power of God. And what he's driving at there is really born from above. But the effect is the same. You'll be born again, but it's that born from above. You become a spiritual creature, a new creation in Christ. But back to the text. So we're back in verse 4 of Titus chapter, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 1, that we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. So do you feel comfortable? Do you have people you're working with? that you know are strong enough, that you can trust them enough to say, go back to Thessalonica and tell them how we're doing. That we need them to know, we need to hear from them, but I want to send you Timothy. Remember, Paul and Timothy have a good relationship because Paul made picked him up on a journey where he met him and his grandmother and all and got him on board with the missionary team and became a valuable part. And Paul grew to have confidence in Timothy that he could send him back to Thessalonica, get a report, and come on back. Well, think about this. Are you a Timothy in your life? Is your life so consistently broadcasting Christ and you're so faithful in your word and conduct that people would call you that kind of Timothy that we can send out and use? Are you usable to people? Or are you just sort of hanging out at home, kind of pulling up the spiritual covers and not getting out much? Well, you know what that's like. You know where that's going. But make sure you're fellowshipping regularly with people of like precious faith. That we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the habit of some. But all the more as we see the day of Christ approaching. Really important. So let's summarize where we've been today. Number one. Do you have a Timothy in your life that you can send out? Are you a Timothy? Somebody that's faithful, honest trustworthy, that you can send them on a mission like that. Number three, are you making more Timothys? Are you out there actually sharing your faith, being a daily minister for Christ, using your spiritual gifts? We don't all have the gift of evangelism, but thank God that Paul said, hey, Timothy, I want you to work like an evangelist, do the work of an evangelist, even if you don't have the gift of evangelism. So we can be really encouraged in Christ today that we can have friends like that, that we can be friends like that, that we can build one another up in Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you for the people on earth who love Jesus. This whole channel is dedicated to doing it together. I love hearing your comments, anything you want to throw out there. I love reading them, responding to them. I love the people who give us a like or even a dislike. But great, let's hear from you. This ministry is really our ministry. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us and that you perform this ministry through us. We give you all the glory and honor. Lord, may we work through you. May you work through us in all that we do. May we glorify you. Thank you, Lord, for the Lord Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Hallelujah. Before I close the video, I'd like to share with you four verses about eternal life. I often ask people this simple question. Why should Jesus let you into heaven? And the answer to that question surprises many people because it comes from the Bible and it's simple and it's clear. 
Most folks, when they hear that question, they tell me, well, I've been good, or tried to do more good than bad, or I tried hard, or I've done a lot of nice things, and I hope God will let me into heaven. They somehow think if their good works outweigh their bad works, that God will let them in. But God says, actually, I'll let people into heaven because of a free gift. But the story from Jesus starts with four verses, and I'm going to read them one at a time. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 You see, for every person who lives today on earth in human flesh, we've all sinned, every one of us. We've all told a lie. We've all done or said something that made somebody else angry, and we were doing it out of anger ourselves. We've all done things to hurt other people at one time or another. God says that's all sin, and I look upon that as falling short of my glory, God says. God says we should never fall short of his standard, which is the glory of God. Well, is it serious that we've sinned? Should I be worried about that? Everybody sinned. Why should I worry? Well, consider Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death that all of us deserve the death penalty. At the moment we sin, we incurred the death penalty for the smallest sin or the biggest sin. I'm happy that Romans 3, 20, 6, 23 continues and says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, if you've been listening carefully and thinking about what the Bible says, so far we've learned that we're all sinners, we all fall short of the glory of God, and we all deserve the death penalty. This doesn't sound like good news until you read the last part of that last verse. It says that God has a free gift for all of us. It's in Christ Jesus our Lord and it's eternal life. The free gift of eternal life that only Jesus Christ can give you. He said he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Why would God offer us this great gift if we're all sinners? Well, Romans 5, 8 tells us, it says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. He died in our place. God loves sinners like you and like me. He died in my place and in your place. He paid the death penalty for me. I often illustrate the free gift like this that I have this old Nissan truck. It has 285,000 miles on it. It's not that great a truck. It sits at the beach every day. But I illustrate the point this way. I hold up the keys to my truck and I say, I'm going to make you a symbolic gift of my truck. But until you take the keys out of my hand, it's not your truck yet. Well, let me tell you what I mean. A lot of people have been going to church for years. They know all about Jesus. They can quote verses about Jesus. But they know in their heart that they're not quite right with God. And there's never been a day in their life where they've been born again and they know it. You see, they're just staring at the keys in God's hand and he's offering you the free gift today of saying, reach out by faith and receive that free gift and take it into your heart today. Receive the free gift. Okay, how do we do that? Well, Romans 10.9 tells us how to do that. It says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he means saved from the death penalty, eternal destruction. So we can receive that free gift right now by faith, and we can pray a prayer together. I urge you to pray with me. I'm going to pray it right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I confess that I am a sinner and I fall short of the glory of God. I confess too that I deserve the wages of sin, which is death. But Lord, you offer me the free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I accept that free gift right now. I believe that you love me and that God died on the cross for me, that Jesus Christ is God, and he died on the cross for me. 
You paid the death penalty for me, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much. I confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. I repent of my sins, and I accept that free gift, Lord. Thank you so much that you have forgiven me. In your name I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I'd love you to send me an email and we'll rejoice together. Send me the email at friend at christassembly.org. That's friend at christassembly.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Hallelujah. Scripture quotations taken from the NASB, New American Standard Bible, copyright 1995 by the Lockman Foundation. Used by permission, all rights reserved.